Montreal, 1935. The occasion, dedication ceremony of the Montreal Neurological Institute, a pioneering center of neurosurgery. Precisely a decade after, a young Christian doctor from an obscure village in South India would join the ranks of the great only to return to his motherland and set a blazing trail in neurosurgery. That man with a missionary seal was Jacob Chandy, pioneer neurosurgeon and medical educator. Hey, good morning, Professor Jacob Chandy. Nice to see you here today morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. I am glad to be here. Let us look back some time ago as to what induced you to take up medicine as a profession. Yes, that's a very uh, important question. And uh, my father being an Anglican presbyter, his uh, uh, duty was in a remote village and we were a happy home there with myself, my brother, and sister, and a young new baby was born 21 days before. And we, my father, my brother, and myself, we came away to the wedding of my mother's brother. At that time, my mother died without even father being there, which was a great shock to us, and also, that made me wanting to know why my mother died. And from that time onwards, this was constantly in my mind. Of course, therefore, my desire to go into medicine started from there. It has been a sad beginning for a childhood. Kindly tell us about your early childhood as well as education which you had at that time. My father being a presbyter, he was transferred from place to place. So my high school education had been in two different places. After that, I came to the CMS College, Kotem, where I lived with my grandfather and little brother, and not my father. The, from their college, I went to the medical college. Would you tell us about your medical education. I joined the Madras Medical College, and at that time there was no other college in the south, and only few colleges in uh, the whole of India. And mind you, at that time it was the British rule, and uh, all our professors were British men, and even many other or in the staff were Britishers. And uh, as a student, myself and many others felt that we were treated as second-class citizens. Could you tell us about how the education was being imparted? Of course, it is all in English, and uh, our uh, preclinical subjects were rather boring, as uh, most of the medical colleges. Uh, but the clinical subjects felt, I felt very thrilled. And uh, I had very much uh, involved myself in the clinical care of the patients. That was my personal. Uh, at that time, again, uh, there were uh, a few teachers who were very, very, very good in helping us. They were assistants uh, to these Britishers. During my clinical years, especially in the final year, when I had the surgical posting, I had a very severe traumatic experience. That was a uh, lady, 45 years old lady, with a severe headache and uh, blindness, with a typical case of a pituitary tumor. Was brought in and I was uh, uh, studying that case, my own case, and came into the theater for surgery. The surgeon had posted the case for that day. And I was ready with, uh, with, to see the patient right at that time in the operating room. That day, that patient was brought in at uh, 10 o'clock and wheeled out the body, dead body at five o'clock. 
This made me feel very unhappy. The reason must have been, I thought at that time, inadequacy in knowledge how to handle that case. Because later on, when I was a professor here in Velour, after treating for more than a hundred cases, not a single mortality had been there. So, callousness in the knowledge and the treatment of patients was something that must be decried all the time. That was my bad experience. From there, I decided also that I must go for neurosurgery. What were your plans after your graduation? After my graduation, uh, I did not want to join the government service. Because, do you know, at that time, again, we were under the British. Therefore, uh, the Defence Force, of course, no, because they were repressing our own people. So, the other, I wanted to go for postgraduate work, and I, my father did not have money for that. Therefore, the options were limited limited to either a mission hospital or a private practice. Uh, At that time, I hear that you were one of the pioneers who went for Middle East. Oh, no, I was not a pioneer. A friend of mine who was then beginning the oil field in Arabia wrote to me and said, now look, you want to go abroad for postgraduate studies? Here is a chance for you to make plenty of money. You come with to Arabia and you can make money. So I went to Arabia. Oh, what has been your experience in Arabia? And what led you to go on to Bahrain? In Saudi Arabia, there were two different kinds of hospitals. One for the Arabs in a shack where my friend and myself, we were there. And the other is a posh American hospital with every f equipment and uh, every kind of staff also there. But we had nobody and we were only dealing with the Arab uh, uh, workmen and they were mostly healthy people except that uh, they had syphilis or gonorrhea. I was fed up with it. I, for two reasons. One, this discrimination. And uh, we didn't love that. There was no other job really to do that. And so, uh, because of the contract was for one year, we stayed there uh, the time of... Uh, uh, any time we have free time, we went to... Uh, I went to uh, Bahrain Islands, uh, where uh, there was a good mission hospital with well-equipped equipment. And so I was taking care of that whenever possible. Then, during the time when I was coming away from there, I found that Dr. Storm, who was the chief of that, was going away and uh, uh, Paul W. Harrison was coming in to take his place. During an interval of two weeks, there wasn't anybody there. They requested me begged whether I would help them out. And I was very happy to do that. Oh, it will be very interesting to know your experience with uh, Dr. Paul Harrison and Bahrain Mission Hospital. Paul Harrison considered me as his son. He and his wife, Anne, took me to stay with them. And uh, he was a, such a disciplined man that I was also under that discipline. There, we had entirely a different schedule of work, uh, getting up to going to bed at night. It was all planned program. Our uh, clinic, our uh, hospital work, our study hours, our uh, food time, and uh, everything, in, including research work, is conducted at that time in the specific manner. He encouraged me, taught me, uh, guided me, and he was my mentor. 
the mission hospital, we did surgery, we did everything. And that was how I have. And there again, since he was involved with uh, uh, neurosurgical procedures with Harvey Cushing, he had an inclination uh, uh, with the neurosurgical procedures. And he encouraged me to go into neurosurgery from then onwards. He wanted me to go for postgraduate work, and that is how my life uh, planning was uh, finished. Meanwhile, you must have got married. Yes, yes, of course. My father made all the arrangements. It is the traditional pattern of arranged marriage. And they have arranged everything and called me, to, uh, called me home for the marriage. My wife's name was Thangam, and she was a graduate of the Madras University. We visited our parents for a little while, two weeks, and came back to Bahrain, where Harrison's met us at the airport and took us to their home. We stayed there for a month, and then we had moved to our own house. There we had our son. Matthew was born there. And uh, there was a separate women's hospital also attached to this that was managed by both Harrison, that meant I was also involved to some extent, and another American lady doctor. Would you like to tell us some of your interesting experiences which you had at Bahrain further? That's very interesting. In our uh, uh, I told you about uh, my uh, disciplined manner. One of the things that Harrison's did was to have uh, evening after clinic time visit some of the important or uh, uh, necessary personnel. Some of them may be very poor, some may be rich, with uh, some problem or other. And I was always involved with that. He took me to a, a patient who he visited very often. And he had asked me, you come with me and visit this man. Put particular attention to him. This man was with us for six months with a very bad uh, chronic osteomyelitis of the leg involving uh, uh, a part of the both the, uh, uh, both the bones. Then uh, he was there uh, for about uh, three months, or it's more, much more than three months. During that time, we operated three times. And he got well, and uh, he was leaving. I used to wonder. Why he was particular to uh, take me there and talk to me, and he always talked to Lord with the loving care. Especially, uh, he will go and drink coffee with them, the usual Arab style. And he also had particularly told me, you pray for this man. I didn't know what it was for. One day, the just before he was being discharged, he told me, before going there to him, now look, this man had shot, his job was looting. Uh, he was one of these bandits who took uh, the money from people, shoot them, kill them, what, to a plunder, plundering. And like that, in Baghdad, near Baghdad area, he was uh, go doing the same thing. It happened that a, a visitor from America had come to the missionary there, whose name was Bucket. This uh, Reverend Bucket, he was a minister. This Reverend Bucket uh, was shot by this Abdullah. His name was Abdullah and killed him. Of course, 
I, this, as soon as Abdullah came in, Harrison knew who he was. That was why he was giving more attention to Abdullah. And uh, this, during this evening's conversation, he put it very, very gently first and then vehemently to him. Abdullah, do you know whom you killed in Baghdad at that raid? He said, no, you killed my brother. And Abdullah was shaken, shaken to its roots. He cried, he said, why didn't you kill me? Three times I was under river operation. My leg, I could not walk for uh, a, one year. Then I came here for treatment. You operated on me. I am well now. I am walking. How can I understand that? So now look, this is the love of God. If I did not have the love that God gives me, and if I can't give it to you, then I am not a Christian. I am not a human being. So you do me one favor. He said, whatever you do, I will do. Whatever you say, I am ready to. You do me a favor. Don't go on shooting and killing. Their God is love. Our God is your God. You are a Muslim. That is my same God. And don't kill your own brothers. I remember you telling me an episode of how a sheikh was remaining unconscious in the desert and how you went and treated him. You see, you have to remember this is 60 years ago. And in those days, there was no oil. They were all very backward in every aspect. They were just hunting from going from place to place. So this sheikh was unconscious in the desert. He had, and in his whole retinue, were in the desert. We went there, myself and my wife, Thangam, was with me. We went there, she had to use all for the, the yeah, to get in there itself all covered. Before going, we had to get the political agent's uh, permission and seal with us that we are uh, British subjects and they will not harm us. Anyway, with the son's uh, 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 pressure, we went. When I went there, he was completely unconscious. When his consciousness returned after the treatment, oh, gee, well, that was a thing that was surprising. Every, the sheikh who was uh, unconscious woke up and looked around and saw his son. So he asked him, who is this? To uh, pointing to me. Then he said, this is the uh, Hakim came from uh, Bahrain to treat you. Then you should have seen what had happened. He took my hand and kissed me. The whole gang of people all around knelt down to kiss my feet. Oh, what a time. <laughs> so this is one. Another thing in the same uh, uh, episode uh, that uh, after a week when he was well and uh, I was going away, he gave a banquet. And it was a big banquet in the traditional uh, Arab way. Okay. There he said, I want to give you a gift. I said, okay, I will be very glad to. Then he said, the gift is 40 slaves. I said, no, we don't want the slaves. No, you have to take them. They will serve you till with their life. I said, now look, we live in a world where there is no sla slavery. And if they c come to me, they will be all free. But I won't be able to feed them and look after them. But I said, if you insist, I will talk with everyone. And if they say, 
that they want to come with me, I will take. But I can't do anything for them. They are all free men and women. Then uh, they said, when after talking with them, they said, No, sir, we want to stay with the Sheikh and get his protection. This is what happens. Unless we have responsible for our own life, we cannot do anything. It's a good lesson that it taught me. Having done all that, I would be very much interested to know how you started your training in neurosurgery in the United States? Well, uh, Paul Harrison had reserved a seat for me in, in, uh, for the troops who are getting back from the war so uh, For their uh, further training program, they had a course. He had, Paul Harrison had arranged that course for me also. And he paid he, from his own pocket $800 for that course. And I had to make my own money for travel and the maintenance there. At that time, we had to sell all what I had made so far. And uh, Thangam also helped me with it. We took Matthew and Thangam home to my parents, and I went by a troop ship when the troop, uh, troops are returning uh, during their, uh, their uh, term of appointments. And uh, some of them were joining various courses. I was the only Indian on that troop ship. And we went there. Uh, I, I was landed in San Pedro in Los Angeles. I had to come all the way to Philadelphia uh, and then join the university there. There again, I found this uh, discrimination, but I didn't mind. I was taking a course and uh, I joined the course there. There, I found that with a little hard work, I can beat uh, the, the, there is no problem in there. Then after about a month or maybe two months, I went to the professor of surgery, uh, research professor there, who will arrange uh, for students to do research activities. And I told him, I can. He immediately checked up with the professors to know whether I am capable of doing that. Then I started my research. He, he guided me uh, very systematically. I did my work and uh, in eight months' time, I got my credentials for the course, and I also got uh, into the research department, which in which I worked for another six months, and got my master's in physiology in neurosciences. Then, during that time, when I was in the research lab, an old lady with gray hairs, silvery gray hairs, came to my department and asked for me. Who was that old lady? She was Dr. Oliver. She was uh, the secretary of the Christian Medical Association of India. And she was retiring and going back to her country, Canada. And she came all the way to uh, New York to come and see me in Philadelphia. And I have never heard about her or known her. Then she first said, now look, this was lunchtime. Let us go to uh, a restaurant, ha sit down and have lunch and talk. And I said, fine. I went with her. She ordered the lunch. And then she said she uh, I had known uh, uh, the velour as a Christian medical college. I said, how? Christian in Belur is a women's uh, group of people there, and I have never heard a medical college there. She said, that's right. We have uh, got ready to change the whole LMP school into a university medical college. 
uh, it's only from uh, two years ago. Uh, and now we are s collecting stuff. And Dr. Cochran, who was the, uh, the director there, told me specifically to go and see you in Philadelphia and find out whether I, I will come to Velo. She came and said uh, the, all this, and I said I don't know anything about it, whether I'll get uh, uh, appointment in uh, any place, uh, whether uh, where I should go, I don't know. Uh, now, from what uh, I have learned from uh, Dr. Uh, the professor of uh, surgery there, that I can apply anywhere and they will give me a seat. There was Francis Grant in United in Philadelphia and then Montreal also, the Montreal Neurological Institute. India has become an independent nation and uh, she told me that uh, the Commonwealth degrees will be acceptable in India and therefore Montreal Neurological Institution uh, must be the place where you should go. That uh, made me think of uh, Montreal Neurological Institution and I put in my application to Dr. Penfield. And I got the reply back very soon that I am very well, much welcome there and to come as soon as I could. Uh, well, I uh, left uh, Philadelphia with uh, grateful thanks that uh, I have able to get not only the surgical uh, diploma, but also a master's degree in physiology. Would you tell us about your training in Montreal Neurological Institute? Well, I went to Montreal Neurological Institute and I met the director. He spent at least an hour with me to find out all about me, my needs, what is the purpose of my coming over, and what is my background, and what are things I have done. And uh, after hearing that, he knew exactly what I wanted to. He told me, well, you are going back, and I will give you the training which will suit you. Then he sent me uh, with one of the chief residents of uh, his special favored man and said, I will take care of Dr. Chandi. He is very new to this country and so you must take special care of his needs, what he wants and how he should, and show him where he can get uh, all the necessary things in there. After a week, you take him to his room, which, you know, is allotted for him and show him where he can get the laundry done and all that done. And take him to the dining room where you can have your food. In other words, he looked after me like, uh, again, Paul Harrison, just the way he dealt with me. And I was very happy. Then, he, uh, afterwards, I was posted to the neurology with Professor uh, Francis Gra Norton. Uh, Norton, Mike Norton. There, Francis, uh, again, he was an anatomist as well. So, the, the, the just neurology and anatomy simultaneously was going on. Then we were, we were uh, very many seminars, uh, various ways, the whole institution was geared to the training program. We had uh, been posted into pathology and uh, uh, the, uh, every weekly meetings of various kinds and uh, also journal, club, uh, all kinds of things were there. In other words, you had a good exposure in various aspects of the specialities of uh, neurosciences. Sir, and I was able to get to know each of these scientists and how they are going about in the development of them. That must have been a great advantage. That is an advantage because they were also told 
what my uh, needs are. Uh, then, after about three months, I was fully assigned to the surgical part of it. That was uh, William Cohn. William Cohn must be a very interesting person. Oh, he was a marvelous man. A superb technician. You can't get a better technician. And uh, he was a, he also had a very bad business as regards we students were concerned. He works like nobody's business. He all the time he is in the hospital. He comes early and uh, then uh, let me tell you, he, at the operation time, he wants us to bring the patient and give all the details of the patient, which he already knew. He knew everything, but still he will ask them what everything about it and what are you going to do, how you are going to do all that. Then he will operate. When he is operating, the wheel have to be on the toes. And he will ask us to take the patient back to the bed, uh, back to the ward. Then we don't see him till the other patient is all ready. Meanwhile, uh, we are going on with the patient care. And then what happens is, this whole thing is finished by about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the surgery part. Then we don't see him for some time, except in the various labs or various situations where he is conducting some courses, where which we we'll have to attend. Then we have our meal at night, evening, and uh, we'll be doing our ward work. And he, about 11 o'clock at night, he starts coming. Then we all join together. That In is other the, words, this was a continuous process. Continuous process. And he goes on his uh, teaching program, intensive checking and intensive teaching at that time. And he ends up by about 1.30 every night. 1.30, he will take the, his residence, that will be about three or four of us, uh, to a uh, nurse's kitchen, and he will make toast and eggs by himself, or a bacon, whatever he feels like, and feed us all. Then he will say, good night, and he will go. We think he goes off to the house. And his wife several times told me they had invited us to their house. Well, they said, now, this man, he is everywhere. I never see him. He comes at night and he sleeps. Early morning, he goes off. He will have uh, sometimes a dinner here, sometimes a breakfast here. We don't know where he is. In other words, the sort of a concentrated training which you had helped you enormously in starting a department of your own later on. Yes, that is the most important thing. And the interesting thing is, when I came back to Velo, and uh, a few years, several years later, I had a letter from Professor Rasmussen, who was at that time director there, that one day William Cohn had his usual night rounds, taught the uh, students, gave them the coffee, he went to his office. Next morning, they were cleaning up the office and found him dead on his chair with the uh, hands on the table. That is William Cohn. William Cohn was thus a remarkable person who was absolutely dedicated to teaching and training. Meanwhile, did anything happen which gave you an inducement to go to CMC Hospital, Velo? It did. A lot of things are happening. Uh, sit down. And uh, let me tell you, first of all, the Robert Cochran, director of uh, Velo, came to see me. He was a visionary. He wanted to develop the new institution as the best in Asia. And so he had already tried to get a thoracic surgeon and uh, already got one. 
and he was after me to take up Bellur as a neurosurgeon. And he came and asked me uh, whether he wants, uh, whether I wanted any financial help. He would give all that. What is it that uh, I must go there? And he won't go without uh, giving in a, a promise. I said, don't ask for promise and all that. I will consider it. I will think and pray about it. If it is uh, God's will, I will come. That is how I left uh, before going to uh, Chicago. There, why did I go to? Penfield called me to his office and said, now, my assistant, Rasmussen, Theodore Rasmussen, is being appointed as professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery in the Billings Hospital in Chicago University. Uh, where uh, to the, uh, from the buildings, the professor there the, uh, went to Hopkins. Therefore, uh, he told me, that is, Penfield told me, you go with Rasmussen. He will teach you further in how to develop your neurosurgery department. That so is how I went to B uh, Billings. Billings. So you polished the further neurosurgery at Billings. Billings. Billings was a final touch, if you want to put it that way, for my, at that place. First of all, Rasmussen made me not only just a chief assistant, but as a, an associate. He was also a very nice man, and I still get letters from him. And he came here uh, to see our department. And you know, by the way, uh, Will, uh, Penfield also came to Mount uh, Vellur to... Uh, of course, of uh, course, uh, I know that. Uh, you were Meanwhile, uh, I would uh, like you to tell us how exactly you decided to come to Vellur and what exactly has been the role of Paul Harrison in oh. making you come to Vellur. Yes. Uh, before talking about Paul Harrison, I want to say about three other people. One is uh, Lysa Chako, the other is uh, uh, Saur Ryan, and the third is uh, Sir Lashmi Shumadalya. Now, uh, Lysa was a staff of Velour already, and she was sent from Velour to take postgraduate work in anatomy in Oxford. She took her PhD, and she was touring around in the various research labs in the United States, a few of them, and was going back. And she, hearing that I am there, wanted to come and see me. I knew her as a medical student. Then uh, she told me that there is a man here who, born and brought up in Velo, who is taking a PhD course in uh, theology, who is a father, a father, a uh, priest, and uh, whether uh, I want to see him. I said, I'll be glad to see him if he wants to come and see me. So in a couple of weeks' time, Saurayan contacted me and I had a talk with him. His problem was that he was not getting salary and not uh, any time, and, and also that he was not getting more interested in uh, this theological higher studies. Then I suggested to him, why not you come to Vellur if I am going there? If you can be a, a medical superintendent with an MBA in a hospital administration, that will be wonderful. There is no hospital in India now with a hospital administrator with these qualifications. That will be wonderful. So he said he will think about it. And later on, I found that he was admitted there because of the recommendation that I have given and got scholarship, finished it. He came and when I was in Velo and got him appointed as a medical superintendent. The third is Sir Lashmi Samadriya. He was my teacher. So when the dean called me, I went there and dean asked me to take him round the hospital, all the departments, show him what uh, the, we are doing here in the medical education. So I took him round and I gave him lunch at night and at noon. And then uh, he said, what are you going to do? 
I said, I may be coming to Bello. If you are coming to Bello, you come and see me and we can develop a strategy for postgraduate studies and work. I thought, this is wonderful. If I am going, I have an already an ally with the university. That is the way it happened. Then the question about Paul Harrison. I was in Tithers. Lawsers also came to see me. She discouraged me. At the same time, said, you come and see me. But she said, we don't have any money. You don't have anything. I don't know how you will come. What is going to, how you will get the pay or anything. No theater, no patient, no nothing. And we don't know anything about neurology or neurosurgery and so on. I said, doesn't matter. I noted all that. Uh, then, to my great surprise, a man whom I had not seen for uh, four or five years, that's a Paul W. Harrison, just appeared. This is uh, the month of August. He came and said, no, what are you doing? How much have you proceeded? My backstory, I told him all that and I showed him all the files which I had uh, there with me. And uh, uh, he looked back, we prayed together and he said, look, if you are to go to Velour, money will come. I had written to them, said, without money, how can I come? I must have some basic equipment. And he left. And I was depressed more and more, getting worried, what am I going to do? Am I going to start private practice or something like that? But by November, Paul Harrison came again. Because I was anyway leaving by the end of December. Paul Harrison came and said, send a cable to Bello. Tell them that uh, you are coming. Don't bother about money. We will find money. Then, Paul thanked me, thanked, I thanked him, and he left. Two weeks later, he came back again with another $8,000. That means five plus eight. That much I had already with me. And he said, uh, I make all the arrangements, buy all the equipments you want. So with that, I could manage everything, including an EEG machine, which I said, no, don't send now. Let me go there and get a man who can handle it, and so on. And uh, the whole thing was organized. Uh, I got all the equipments I wanted. And on the 20th of January, I think, that was the date, uh, 1949, I said goodbye to all my friends and teachers particularly Dr. Rasmussen and his wife, uh, uh, very much, we were very close friends. And uh, I took a steamer back to India. That was my uh, trip back. Having left the coast of Atlantic and coming to India, how did you come into contact with Dr. Scudder and CMC Hospital Velour? Uh, Dr. Scudder was not in the hospital at that time. Dr. Scudder usually stays uh, after retirement in Kodekanal and comes about uh, four months or five months a year. And that time she was away in uh, Kodekanal and she came sometime in in June, July. So I met only the medical superintendent there and I started my work on the 14th of April, 1949. Uh, uh, now, the first thing I wanted to do there was to meet the people and know where and what is going on. I found that the college itself is situated about four miles away from the hospital, which is uh, uh, in the heart of the town. While uh, the uh, college campus was uh, four miles away in, in a hilly, hilly area with beautiful uh, surroundings, 
which I enjoyed very much, its beauty, the natural setting for a good medical campus. I was very much uh, happy about that. In the hospital, when I came uh, to see the hospital, of course, uh, the total number of beds that the hospital had at that time, only four, 405 beds, 50 beds. Of course, the university doesn't, uh, won't approve that. They were frantically building up uh, buildings for the wards and uh, op and there were only two operating rooms and that also, uh, it was in a very unhappy situation. In other words, at that time, there was almost nothing Absolute, to start. Absolutely nothing. Um, I did not even have a chair to sit where I had to share the medical superintendent's uh, office and a share there. Therefore, uh, I had nothing. Uh, the hospital had nothing. The equipments I brought, I got it. Then uh, they were building a second, a third operating room and I installed all my equipments there. So my first two, three weeks were only getting acquainted with the staff and putting my things in order so that I can start my work. Obviously, at that time, people there did not know what sort of thing neurosurgery is. Nothing. They did not have a, a clue. Not only the staff, the public, nobody knew. Therefore, my first, when introducing myself to the staff, the professor of medicine becomes number one. So, I went to Dr. Kudumbaya, who was at that... In my student days, he was a demonstrator in the medical college. So, I had a already new Dr. Kudumbaya. Then I asked him about... Uh, he, the first thing, he said, after welcoming me, he said, now, what are you going to do? As regards the tumor surgery or tumor is concerned, for 30 years I worked in, as a professor of medicine in various medical colleges. And... There were only three cases that I have seen, that also only at the post-mortem. I said, sir, well, I agree that you did not see, but I don't want to say why you did not see. Anyway, uh, give me permission to uh, see your patients, examine your patients, and if it is something that I can do something, can I come and borrow those patients away from you? He said, sure. So that is how I started going from uh, Dr. Kudumbaya's ward from one ward to the other. There I found even the first day I started looking around, the head nurse told me, here is a man who had been vomiting and with severe headache, crying all the time. Could you see him? What was he being treated for? Oh, they were thinking it is a... Uh, syphilitic uh, pack meningitis, and uh, they were treat giving anti-syphilitic treatment. I said, okay, this is wonderful. So I took my bag, went and examined him thoroughly. Sure enough, this was, was a tumor. A tumor. <laughs> there was no question about it. It was a frontal lobe tumor. And uh, what I did was, uh, went back to Kudumbaya, told him you have already a tumor in the ward. And then he said, now you uh, you can take the case, but uh, I have to transfer them to a medical surgical ward and then get the nurses all, they were all, hey, what do I can do? I don't know anything about it, I don't know. I said, don't know anything about it. I am here to teach you and do everything. So from the nurses onwards, I had to start teaching them how to take care of them, how to dress them, how to... Anything connected with the neurological work, I had to teach them. I took the patient over there, got it cleaned even up to cleaning the head. Shaving everything, and... everything. And after that, I had to go from theater to the anesthetist, to the radiologist, to see whether they know everything about it. They did not know anything about it, but fortunately, I had Dr. 
Iris Carter, his own niece, was a radiologist who had been sent to the UK and she had a diploma in radiology, so at least I could tell her. And she, she said, I haven't done any, but uh, she did not have even a technician uh, to help her. She said, she will help me to uh, post the patient. Uh, I did all that myself. I told her to read up the parameters, how to handle the machine itself. That was an old machine with nothing very much in it. So anyway, I did the ventriculogram there, took the patient to the operating room. There again, anesthetist was told, the operating sister, the senior sister, the matron himself, herself, came and helped me to... So in other words, you I had taught them everything and then got the patient onto the table, operated and demonstrated the tumour. That's right. I called Kudumbaya to come and see. The first case which he was had diagnosed as syphilis is was a tumour. Then he was so under shut because I had brought him with the gown and all that inside the theatre and uh, handed over the, the tumour to him. And uh, he looked at me, looked at the tumour, and uh, then itself, Dr. Kudumeya said, Dr. Chandi, I am so happy you have done this. You have taught me. Now, go ahead, do all I can give you. I, you ask me, whatever I have is yours. How did you go about organizing the department and started postgraduate education? Uh, I told you uh, co the cooperation and goodwill of uh, Kudumbaya. That was pervaded throughout the institution. Uh, it was terrible excitement for everybody. Oh, now we can remove brain tumor. Then uh, what had happened was uh, that uh, I had to find out where I can get one or two beds. So the, all staff, surgical beds, two, two three, three of them, and uh, even gynecology of obstetrics gave a couple of beds. Uh, so I had uh, beds, about 10 or 12 of them, were started off throughout the institution. Then uh, the question is, I had no staff, uh, no assistants, no nothing. Only borrowed from various departments, I had them that time. I decided I want to have somebody in, the, uh, in my department who is completely devoted to neurosurgery. And therefore, uh, fortunately at that time, a boy from Calcutta applied saying he wants a neurosurgery. I said, come. When he came, I made him promise that he won't do anything else but neurosurgery. And I took him for a period of three years of uh, intensive neurosurgical training. That was my first training. And he uh, took his... Uh, uh, MS examination from Calcutta University, and he ended, uh, retired as a professor of neurosurgery in an institute uh, in, uh, in Calcutta, and he has done a wonderful job. So I am very proud of my first, even the first students. Then uh, it happened uh, that I started uh, teaching a program for neurosurgery, uh, in the beginning, government sent staff from various states. Then not only the government, uh, private st students were uh, coming. And uh, then uh, Defense Force people came for neurosurgery. And so I was even uh, appointed as consultant to the armed forces. And uh, meanwhile, the program was uh, developing very rapidly. And many people were coming uh, from all over India at that time for treatment also. I had people from every part of the... And even, uh, interestingly enough, from Ceylon, uh, during the time when their Prime Minister fell off from the horse, they sent me their special plane to go there immediately to look after him. So it was... Uh, in, you, you throughout India, that need for neurosurgical work became aware. 
And another thing I was doing at that time was uh, writing articles in various medical journals and in the training uh, for the medical colleges. Uh, then you yourself, uh, you, uh, you applied through the government and I took you as one of my students. That is, the, you are one of the early ones who got it. So you know very well my training programs. Very well. Yes, Professor Chan. Oh, it was a very strenuous, well-disciplined training program that we had. All the 24 hours of the day, seven days of the week, and 365 days of the year. We had a very good grounding in neurology, neuropathology, and all other allied sciences, including neurobiochemistry. We were also given training as to how to present papers and also to program research work. So it was in all a very comprehensive way of developing a good neuroscientist besides being a neurosurgeon. So I must say that there have been days on days, 24 hours to 48 hours, when I had no occasion even to get back home. So the training program was so continuous and strict. All the same, I would very much like to know, during your period as administrative heads in various positions in CMC. Could you recount some of those experiences? Yes, some of them. And uh, I particularly want to say that uh, the uh, when I came to CMC, I, des I already said Ida Scudder was not there. Ida Scudder came about six months after I have joined her. And she came to my uh, office. At that time, I had a small office. And uh, uh, she came with her little dog and uh, a stick with her. And she uh, was very happy that I have joined. Because she was uh, very sure that uh, whether I would, were not sure whether I would be able to come and join because there was no finance. But uh, thankful that I could come, and she hugged me and told me that God will bless you, and left. She used to come periodically to the operating room and say, what a marvelous work we are now doing. What in my days were nothing, and so on. And then one day I had a very bad confrontation with the institution. That was when I was a principal and I was also in the council everywhere. And uh, the Dr. Carmen was then the director. That, wa that was uh, the question about who owns the institution. It belonged to the foreigners in the beginning when I joined. And I, I being a treasurer and uh, administrator in various capacity, including principalship, I knew very well this won't work. We will have to change that whole constitution and it must become Indian, uh, basically. And uh, it must be the Indian Christian churches that own the ch institution. Are, we are becoming, I told them, we are, are a new uh, independent nation and all kinds of foreigners will be out. No question about it. This was solved after when I gave even six months' notice to quit. That was a very, very traumatic and an enjoyable time for me. Well, after that, the, the institution went off very well. And Lakshmi Samadhilya, our vice chancellor, I told you about my meeting him in the United States, in uh, Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that man was my ally. Therefore, uh, as a principal, to go to him for postgraduate studies, for this and that, and we made the syllabus for the MCH program, or which you called an MS, and uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was easy. I was able to develop at least uh, five or Ten, uh, 10 or more uh, departments uh, fully fledged with postgraduate qualification uh, degrees and degrees. That was 
a remarkable thing that God permitted me to know Lakshmi Samudra, and He came and He was all in all for whatever we developed. That is how this this institution became one of the leading institutions in India because Lakshmi Samudra, and I praise Him, and I salute Him. For what so have. obviously, with uh, Lakshmana Swamudriyar's help, the postgraduate training program for the first time in India was created. To recount, we had the young person from Calcutta, Dr. Aran Roy to start with. Then it was Dr. Gajendra Singh, Dr. Brigadier Mahendra Singh from uh, Army. Then we had Dr. Dharkar from Jaipur. Then we had uh, the regular uh, MCH others. program in which Dr. Mathai was oh. the first student followed by Dr. Jacob Abraham, Dr. Banerjee. Unlike that, we have had a succession of really a galaxy of trained neurosurgeons I who are now occupying key positions in various centers in India. Yes, but you have not mentioned about Ramamurthy. Ramamurthy, B. Ramamurthy, the, uh, the man who came two years after I started, he has been a remarkable person who has developed the Institute of Neurology in Madras and is known all over the world. And he was the president of the uh, Neurological Society and he was the president of the World Federation of Neurosurgeons who met in Delhi. You know that. And I found that it is impossible for me to go all over India because many people started to call me or Ramamurthy to go to various places to see patients and to treat them. Of the important thing that had come about was uh, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences had no neurological surgeons at all. Therefore, one occasion when uh, uh, I was in Delhi, I was uh, I understood that Cecil and Nair's brother had an accident. So I had to make her understand vividly that she must develop. She was, by the way, the chairperson of the All India Institute. Therefore, I told her, if she is not going to develop the neurological institute, uh, neurological setup there, the country has not got a, the really needed person. So she asked me whom I know about it, and I told her, P. N. Tandon, who had been trained in Montreal Neurological Institute, maybe somewhere where they have to find her. She found him and appointed him within a week's time to develop neurology and neurosurgery in All India Institute. And I'm very proud that this is one of the pioneer institutions in India now. Then uh, there were various places. I have. Uh, been uh, asked by the even the uh, family uh, from the Nehru family, from Mary Maharaja who had fallen from the horses, uh, and I mentioned something about. So obviously, going. you had occasion to see a number of uh, very important personalities in India, whom I, you had occasion to treat. Would you tell at least a couple of instances? What did, uh, there are so many. Uh, I had even to operate in Bombay and uh, various places. Before that, the postgraduate development coming in, how do you think it came? Leshmi Samadhiliyar, I told you, had been with us, uh, with, I met him. I already mentioned that. He was a stalwart who helped me in the postgraduate thing, in research and various activities. Uh, how about this uh, Nari contractor and Oh, yes, Nari Contractor, the, our uh, the captain of the team. Cricket the team. Cricket team. Oh, he had a bad accident in the... Uh, West Indies. West Indies. And he had uh, extradural hemorrhage, 
and they were treating him as an emergency in New York. And then the, the man in New York, he had an abscess and all that. And the man, Larry Poole, I don't know whether you know him. You, uh, yes, he, Lawrence Poole, uh, I know. Uh, Poole of uh, the Presbyterian Hospital in New York. He told them, why do you want to stay here and get treatment and waste your money? You go to India, go to Neurological Institute in uh, uh, Bellur and uh, get the treatment from Dr. Chandy. What not? So they came immediately to Bellur. By, by that time, all the enthusiastic, uh, the uh, uh, cricket fans, they all knew about the, American Tractor and CMC. So the, the name of CMC became a well-known name all over India. So, as early as 40 years ago, you decided to start the Neurological Society of India. What was the hurry about it? Well, that's a very interesting question. But I had the feeling, uh, I came to India, I took the Neurological uh, sciences for the simple reason my India must have neurosurgeons to take care of the millions of people. And one man alone can never do anything. Even if few people here and there at random, it is not going to be. So I had the de desire to develop a whole set of people who can do that. That means you must have a postgraduate graduate teaching program. We must have uh, all kinds of arrangements. Then I also had uh, the uh, help of Dr. Uh, Nar uh, Narasimham from uh, Madras, Dr. B. Ramamurthy, and Beldev Singh, who was my colleague, who came and joined with me just for the love of neurology. Now four of us went to uh, Madras, talked with the Ramamurthy and his wife was very gracious to give us tea and so on and we developed a neurological institute. I told them we want to make is an Indian uh, neuro society so that we can to show the world that we can do as better or uh, better work than what they were doing in Europe or in North America. That was the reason why we developed a neurological society and we had the good opportunity uh, to uh, open that, uh, the first func uh, neurological society meeting was held in uh, um, Hyderabad. Hyderabad. Now look, you have been the secretary of this neurological society for at least nine years. Now you know a lot of it. You are going to be, again, an old man getting out. So, why don't you tell me about the Neurological Society? With your wide vision, the four people who started the society in 40 years ago has now grown into a society with more than a thousand members. We have about 450 neurosurgeons and 390 neurologists. There are more people like neuropathologists, neuroanatomists, neuropharmacologists. So we have a very nice close-knit family till now. The society is internationally known. And with all the wide visions put in, the World Congresses have been invited to India. And we held the Congress in New Delhi last year. World Federation of Neurologists, World Federation of Neurosurgery, and Epilepsy International. It has been a momentous event when you were honored with the Medal of Honor. And we were all very proud of it. Could you tell us your reactions when you were conferred the Medal of Honor? Medal of Honor. I, my heart was filled with joy. I was only happy about my own staff, your, my students, all those wonderful people who have made this uh, possible. They, it was not one man's job. And uh, I salute the... Uh, people who have been my teachers, my students, who have 
made this thing possible and my dreams come true. Perhaps Dr. Chandi's greatest moment of honor from his parent institution came in a resolution adopted by the Council of the Christian Medical College, which reads, Dr. Jacob Chandi joined the staff of the Christian Medical College in 1949 as head of a new department of neurology and neurosurgery. By his exceptional professional skill in this new field, his ability to attract and train able men to work with him, and his far-sighted planning, he was able to build up an outstanding comprehensive department of neurological sciences, embracing a clinical service, drawing patients from all over India, higher specialty postgraduate education in both neurology and neurosurgery, and an extensive long-term research program in both clinical and more fundamental aspects of neurology. While maintaining his clinical work and teaching, he undertook increasing administrative responsibilities in the institution. He acted as treasurer for one year in 1950-51, was medical superintendent from 1955 until 1961, and deputy director until 1962 when he became principal. It is during the eight years of his principalship that his greatest contributions to the college have been made. He aimed consistently for high standards in education and research. During these eight years, 10 new departments were recognized for university postgraduate degrees and three others for higher specialty degrees. While recognizing the importance of the highest standards in these more sophisticated fields, he also recognized the need for new emphasis in the undergraduate curriculum, particularly the need for a sounder orientation in community health and a special emphasis on family planning. His abilities and experience were widely recognized by the government of India and other universities, and this recognition is reflected in the numerous appointments he held on academic bodies, advisory committees, and the governing bodies of various institutions. His services in the whole field of medicine were recognized by the President of India, who conferred on him the title of Padma Pushan in 1964. But this national recognition meant little to him compared with the well-being and standing of the college. It was for the Christian Medical College that he expended so tirelessly his great energy and abilities. His greatest pride and joy was in the stature the college achieved during the years of his service here. The Council acknowledges with profound gratitude the very great contribution of this distinguished servant of the college.